بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أذكر نفسي وأذكركم بإخلاص النية لله تعالى We start with the name of Allah we praise and thank Allah for all of the endowments that he bestowed upon us without Allah being obligated to give anything. And we ask Allah to raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his wives, believing relatives and companions, and to protect his nation from what he feared for them. Thereafter, the Sheikh reminds you to correct your intention seeking reward from Allah only. كما أذكر نفسي وأذكركم بمعنى إخلاص النية لله تعالى وهو العمل بالطاعة لله وحده. Just as he reminds himself and you with the meaning of إخلاص of sincerity which is for one to do the deed for the sake of Allah the exalted only. فننوي في قلوبنا أننا نستمع إلى هذا الدرس طالبين الثواب من الله تعالى فقط. So we intend in our hearts that we are listening to this lesson seeking the reward from Allah the exalted only. وإن شاء الله تعالى سنشرع في تفسير جزء تبارك. And God willing we will begin the explanation of the chapter of the the section of the Quran juz to tabarak and we ask Allah the exalted to make us able to give us the strength to complete it and to have the proper comprehension of it and we will begin this explanation with the explanation of the surah entitled Tabarak. وقد ورد عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في فضلها ما رواه الترمذي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال سورة في القرآن ثلاثون آية شفعت لصاحبها حتى غفر له. And it was mentioned in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the merits of this particular surah that in what was narrated by Imam at tirmidhi that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is a chapter in the Quran that contains 30 verses and it intercedes for the one who recited it until he was forgiven. وورد أيضا ما رواه الترمذي أيضا عن رجل من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه ضرب خيمته على قبر وهو لا يظنه قبرا ما عرف أنه قبر فسمع من داخل القبر uh, and it also was mentioned in the hadith narrated by at tirmidhi that a man among the companions of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, pitched a tent on a grave without knowing that it was a grave. And good. And so then this companion went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him what had occurred. And the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam replied, believing what the man had said, that the surah it delivers one from uh, it delivers one to safety and prevents one from the torture of the grave. قال بعض العلماء هناك احتمالان إما أن الله سبحانه وتعالى يخلق في هذه الحروف التي تتألف منها هذه السورة المباركة 
نطقا فتدافع عن صاحبها يعني عمن كان يداوم على قراءتها أو أن الله تعالى يوكل ملكا فهذا الملك يقول يا رب هذا الإنسان كان يحافظ على قراءة سورة تبارك فادفع عنه العذاب لا تعذبه يا الله فيندفع عنه العذاب فلا يتعذب لا في القبر ولا في الآخرة And how is it that this chapter of the Quran protects one and delivers one from safety, uh, delivers one to safety? The scholars said that there's two possibilities of how this interceding occurs. One way is that uh, it's possible that Allah creates an utterance. That Allah the Exalted creates an utterance from the letters of the Surah that um, intercede for the person who recited that Surah and makes an intercession for him so that that so that his punishment would be dropped. And another possibility is that Allah the Exalted authorizes an angel who intercedes for that person, saying that this person used to stick to reciting this surah consistently, and then, insha'Allah, that person's punishment would be dropped. فَلَا يَتَعَذَّبُ لَا فِي قَبْرِهِ وَلَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال شفعت لصاحبها حتى غفر له and thus the person would not be tortured not in his grave nor in the hereafter the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that uh, this surah would intercede for the one who recited it until he was forgiven وهذه السوره لا تاخذ وقتا طويلا من قراها بقراءه صحيحه مصححا القراءه فيها لا تأخذ معه خمس دقائق إن أخذت تأخذ خمس دقائق نعم And this chapter of the Quran it does not take a long time to be recited for the person who recites it correctly reciting it properly it might take five minutes if it took that long فالمداوم عليها خير وبركة كبيرة يعرف من نفسه لصدق حديث الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام لصدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وإذا تكلم فهو الصادق يقول لنا إن من قرأها سينجو من عذاب القبر وسينجو من عذاب الآخرة فالمداوم عليها مع هذا الوقت القصير لا يأخذ وقتا كثيرا عليه and thus the person who is uh, persistent in reciting this surah, uh, then this would have a great benefit and it is much goodness for the person. And this is known because the Prophet وسلم, said it and the Prophet is truthful. If he spoke, then he was truthful in what he said. And so for one to uh, persist in reciting this uh, often, regularly, this is a great goodness that does not take a lot of effort. ومن لم يداوم عليها يكون قد خسر هذا الأمر العظيم ضيع على نفسه أمرا كبيرا وإهمال. And the one who did not recite it persistently, the one who left out reciting it on a regular basis, then they have missed out on a great matter and they have made themselves lose something that has a, a lot of benefit. And this, this chapter has 30 verses. And this chapter of the Quran is considered among the Mecki chapters. جاء فيه ثلاثة أقوال. And the meaning of uh, Mecki, the term Mecki, 
or medani when it is mentioned at the beginning of one of the chapters of the Quran, the scholars mentioned two uh, meanings about it. التفسير الأول قالوا معناه إن ما نزل قبل الهجرة فهو مكي وما نزل بعد الهجرة فهو مدني or it was mentioned more than one meaning for these statements some scholars said that if the surah was called Mekki, then it was revealed before the immigration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Mecca to Al Medina. And if it was called Medani, then it occurred after his immigration from Mecca to Medina. Isan Al Hijri Al Mekki Manazala Kabla al Hijra wal Medani Manazala Bad al Hijra Allah Hazal Kaul. So according to this saying the Mekki verse was revealed before the hit, the immigration of the Prophet, and the Medani verse, the Medani uh, chapters were revealed after the immigration of the Messenger of God. Whether the chapter was revealed, whether uh, when the Prophet was in Medina or outside of Medina or wherever he happened to be without a difference in that. As for the second saying, it is that whatever was revealed in Mecca, then it is considered Mecca, and whatever was revealed in Al Medina, then it is considered. مدني. وعلى هذا القول أنه ما نزل بين مكة والمدينة لا يقال له لا مكي ولا مدني. بين يعني بين مسافة أو بعض هنا وبعض. بينه لا بين هذا وهذا يعني ليس في مكة وليس في المدينة. And according to this saying, whatever was not revealed in Mecca nor Medina is not called مكي nor is it called مدني. والقول الثالث ما كان خطابا لأهل مكة فهو مكي وما كان خطابا لأهل المدينة فهو مدني. As for the third saying, it is that whatever was addressing the people of Mecca, then it is called Mekki, and whatever was revealed addressing the people of Al Madina, then it is called Madani. وهذا العلم بمعرفة المكي والمدني له منافع كبيرة وكثيرة يعرفها العلماء وباختصار منها أن يعرف الحكم الذي نزل قبل من الحكم الذي نزل بعد. And this knowledge of the difference between the Mekki verse and the Medani verse has many great benefits. The scholars of this knowledge have uh, they have the knowledge of that the scholars have the knowledge of that and among the benefits that are found in this branch of knowledge is that one would know which judgments were revealed first and which judgments were revealed later Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim tabtadi'u hadhi as-sura bil-basmalah wa ma'naha abtadi'u bi dhikr ismillah alladhi yarhamu al-mu'mina wa ghayra al-mu'mini في الدنيا ولا يرحم إلا المؤمن في الآخرة فقط. and the surah starts with بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم which means I start mentioning the name of Allah who is merciful to the believers, the believers and the non-believers in this life and merciful to the believers exclusively in the hereafter. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور تبارك الذي بيده الملك تبارك معناه تعالى وتعاظمه 
عن صفات المخلوقين يعني الذي هو منزه عن صفات خلقه الذي بيده الملك أي الذي في تصرفه الملك والاستيلاء على كل موجود فهو يؤتي الملك من يشاء وينزعه ممن يشاء يعطي الملك لبعض عباده من غير فرق سواء كان مؤمنا أو كافرا وهو ينزع الملك ممن يشاء So the first verse that the Shaykh recited for you uh, means that Allah the Exalted is greatly clearer of the attributes of the creation that he is not attributed with any attribute among the attributes of the creation and that he has power over all of the creations he gives reign he gives rulership to whoever he willed among his creation whether believer or non-believer هو الذي يؤتي الملك من يشاء وهو الذي ينزعه ممن يشاء He gives reign and rulership to whoever he willed and he takes away the rulership and the reign from whoever he willed. وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ لَا يُعْجِزُهُ شَيْءٌ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى قَادِرٌ عَلَى أَنْ يُوصِلَ الْإِنْعَامَ إِلَى مَنْ يَشَاءٌ وَعَلَى الْإِنْتِقَامِ مِمَّنْ يَشَاءٌ لَا يُعْجِزُهُ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ That nothing makes Allah the exalted weak. Allah has the power to make the endowments reach whoever he willed. And he has the power to make the punishment reach whoever he willed. Nothing makes him weak. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليمتحنكم أيكم أحسن عملا من الذي يطيع أوامر الله من الذي يؤدي ما أمره الله تعالى عليه ومن الذي يجتنب معاصيه And Allah said الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا that Allah is the one who created life and death to test you which among you would obey Allah's orders and which among you would avoid his what he has prohibited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khalaqana fi hazi al-hayat la liddawami ila ma la nihayah innama khalaqana fi hazi al-hayat wa kallafana bi awamir ونهانا عن أمور فيجب علينا أن نبتعد عنها فنحن في هذا الابتلاء فنحن في هذا الامتحان Allah the exalted created us in this life this life which does not last it's not everlasting and he obligated us with certain matters and he prohibited us from other matters that we're obligated to avoid And in this life, we are tested. ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا فنحن في هذا الامتحان الغني سيموت والفقير سيموت والقوي سيموت والضعيف سيموت والمريض سيموت والصحيح سيموت And so We are in this life and it is a test. The rich person will die. The poor person will also die. Likewise, the strong, the weak, the sick, or the healthy, all of their lives will come to an end. فهذا الغني إن أدى ما أمره الله تعالى به فهو خير له وإن اجتنب ما حرم الله تعالى عليه فهو خير له وأما إن ابتعد عن أوامر الله واقترف معاصيه كان شرا وبيلا عليه. And so this rich person, for example, if he 
fulfilled everything that Allah ordered him to do. He obeyed Allah and avoided all of what Allah prohibited him from. Then his life was good for him. On the other hand, if he avoided what Allah the Exalted made obligatory and fell into that which Allah prohibited, then it would be an evil thing for him. وكذلك الفقير إن أدى أوامر الله واجتنب معاصيه كان خيرا له وإن وقع في وإن ترك أوامر الله واقترف المعاصي كان شرا عليه. And likewise the poor, if he fulfilled all of what Allah made obligatory, then his life would be a good thing, and if he avoided all of what Allah prohibited, then that would be good for him. And if he fell into what Allah prohibited and avoided what Allah made obligatory, then that would be bad for him. وهكذا الأمر مع المريض والصحيح وهكذا الأمر مع القوي والضعيف فإذا العبرة بتقوى الله العبرة بتقوى الله من اتقى الله سبحانه وتعالى في هذه الدنيا على أي حالة كان فهو الرابح ومن لم يتق الله تعالى فهو الخاسر على أي حالة كان and that what we have mentioned is the same situation for the strong or the weak or the sick or the healthy so the consideration is God-fearingness whether the person was God-fearing or not. The person who feared Allah and fulfilled his obligations and avoided the sins, then he is the winner. He is the one who was successful. And whoever, whatever his situation was, other than that. And the one who fell into what Allah prohibited and avoided what Allah made obligatory, then he is the loser, whatever his other situations were. إذا الله سبحانه وتعالى خلق الموت وخلق الحياة خلق هذه الحياة فنحن ممتحنون فيها وخلق الموت الذي هو الداعي لنا المشجع لنا على أن نعمل بما ينفعنا لما بعد الموت فهو المشجع لنا الداعي لنا أن نعمل ما يخلصنا من العذاب في الآخرة. So Allah the Exalted, He is the one who created life and death. And we in this life are tested. And death is that which calls for us, calls to us, or calls for us and encourages us, pushes us to do that which benefits us in the hereafter and to do that which would be a reason for us to be saved from Allah's punishment. الإنسان عندما ينظر في الأمر يرى أمرا ينظر فيه فيقول يعني الإنسان العاقل يقول هذا ينفعني بعد موتي أم يضرني بعد موتي هذا الموت يكون مشجعا له على أن يختار ما يخلصه في الآخرة So the thinking person, the person who's using his mind properly he looks into the matter, he looks into the situation that which is in front of him, this thing, will it benefit me in the hereafter? Is this among the things that would benefit me in what comes after death or it will harm me? So death, that is what calls that person to do which, that which benefits him in the hereafter. It encourages him to do the right thing. <laughs> وهو العزيز الغفور وهو العزيز معناه الغالب الذي لا يعجزه شيء وهو الغفور الذي الذي يغفر الذنب لمن يشاء من عباده وعباده لا ييأسون 
لا ييأسون من التوبة بعد ذلك. In the name of Allah Al-Aziz means that Allah is the one that nothing makes him weak. And Al-Ghafoor is that Al-Ghafoor الذي يغفر الزنب لعباده. And Al-Ghafoor means that he is the one who forgives the sins for his slaves. And the slave would not feel hopeless of Allah's forgiveness after that. الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا بعضها فوق بعض بيّن سبحانه وتعالى قدرته وأنه الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا خلق سبع سماوات بعضها فوق بعض In this verse, Allah the Exalted uh, clarified that he is attributed with great power. He created the seven heavens and one heaven would be above another heaven. Some are on top of the others. الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت ما تجد في خلق الرحمن ما يخالف الحكمة ما تجد يا ابن آدم ما يخالف الحكمة في خلق الله سبحانه وتعالى and that the human would not find in Allah's creation that which contradicts uh, wisdom. Mm-hmm. Yani, look again or return your gaze to the skies. Are, is there in the sky any cracks or is there in it that which uh, that there is not in the sky any cracks? الإنسان إن نظر في شيء في أول مرة قد لا ينتبه إلى خلل فيه قد يكون في هذا الشيء خلل لا ينتبه إلى الخلل الذي فيه لكنه إن نظر مرة ثانية سينتبه ينتبه إلى هذا الخلل والمعنى أن هذه السماء لو نظرت إليها لن ترى فيها ما يخالف الحكمة لن ترى فيها شقوقا لن ترى فيها فطورا لن ترى فيها الشقوق وأنك إن كررت النظر مرة بعد مرة لن تجد فيها إلا ما وجدته في المرة الأولى. Uh, an individual, a person, if he looked at something the first time, he may not be immediately aware of whatever imperfections that thing may hold. But if he looked again and again, then he would become aware of those imperfections if there were any in it. So uh, Allah Ta'ala revealed, look again at the sky, you won't find in it any cracks or that which uh, contradicts wisdom. كرر النظر مر كرر النظر مرتين المعنى كرر النظر لو أيضا نظرت أكثر من مرة أكثر من مرة لن تجد فيها إلا ما وجدته في المرة الأولى لن ترى إلا ما رأيته في المرة الأولى ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير مهما دققت سيرجع إليك البصر ولن تجد يعني سيرجع كليلا متعبا ولن تجد إلا ما وجدته في المرة الأولى. Look again 
and again, you will not find other than what you found when you looked the first time. If you looked over and over, then, you, and you try to pay close attention to what you were looking at, then uh, to the extent that you became tired, then still you would only find that which you found upon the first glance. ثم قال ربنا ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأيضا سبحانه وتعالى يبين لنا قدرته على كل شيء وأنه هو الذي خلق السماوات وهو الذي زينها بالنجوم ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا أي الأولى بمصابيح أي بالنجوم المضيئة فيها And Allah the exalted in this verse clarifies again that he is attributed with power and that he is the one who created the skies and that he adorned or decorated the first sky, the lower sky with stars. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ تأخذ منها الملائكة شعلة من هذه النجوم تأخذ من هذه النجوم شعلة وترمي بها الشياطين التي تحاول أن تسترق السمع من الملائكة الذين يكونون بين السماء والأرض And that the angels take like flares or sparks from these stars and throw them at the devils who are trying to eavesdrop upon the angels who are speaking amongst themselves in the first sky. Al-Badu Shayateen Khidmatan li Badi Al-Kuhan يصعدون إلى أماكن إلى قرب الغمام ليسترقوا السمعة من الملائكة الذين يتحدثون فيما بينهم. Uh, some of the devils, uh, in doing some favor for some soothsayers, they would rise up, they would go and elevate to a place close to the clouds. Uh, attempting to listen in and eavesdrop upon some of the angels who are speaking amongst themselves. الملائكة الله سبحانه وتعالى يطلعهم عما سيحدث في السنة من ليلة القدر إلى ليلة القدر التي تليها فيعرفون ما سيحدث من موت وحياة وولادة إلى غير ذلك فيتحدثون فيما بينهم فيحاول هذا الشيطان أن يسترق السمع منهم حتى يخبر من أرسله ليدجل على الناس فترجمه الملائكة ترميه بشعلة تأخذها من هذه النجوم Allah the exalted gives the angels some knowledge of matters that would come uh, in the year from one night of Al-Qadr to the next night of Al-Qadr which is a specific night during the month of Ramadan. They would uh, gain some knowledge about certain affairs that will occur whether it was a birth or someone's death and other matters and then they speak about these matters between themselves among themselves the angels and Then the shaitan, the devils, would attempt to listen in uh, on their conversation to take that information to those among the soothsayers that they work with among the humans. And the angels would then throw, uh, throw at them these like sparks. وهذه وعندما يرمون بهذه بهذه الشهب إما أنهم يموتون منها أو يصيبهم الخبل. 
يعني يرجعه مجنونا and when the shaytan when the devils are hit with that then either they would die from that or it would make them lose their mind ثم قال بعض الصحابة رضي الله عنهم قال الله سبحانه وتعالى خلق النجوم لثلاث and some of the companions said that Allah the exalted created the stars for three زينة للسماء Allah created them as a decoration for the skies something something to beautify the sky and something that is thrown and Allah created them to be something that is thrown at the devils and as a sign that one would guide themselves with عذاب السعير وأعتدنا لهؤلاء الشياطين عذاب السعير في الآخرة بعد الإحراق بالشهب في الدنيا And Allah revealed that he prepared for those devils the torture of the hereafter after they had been already burned by being thrown with the sparks or the flares from the stars in this life وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير ومعناه ولكل من كفر بالله سبحانه وتعالى من شياطين وغيرهم عذاب جهنم عذاب يتعذبون بها لا يخرجون منها وبئس المصير وبئس المرجع بئس المكان الذي سيكونون فيه and Allah revealed that for everyone who blasphemed, whether it was a human or a jinn, Allah has prepared for them the torture of hellfire, and that is a, a bad place to be. إذا ألقوا فيها معناه طرحوا في جهنم كما يطرح الخطب في النار كما يلقى الخطب في النار سمعوا لها شهيقا سمعوا لجهنم شهيقا يعني صوتا منكرا صوتا بشعا صوتا فظيعا مخيفا وهي تفور تغلي بهم وهي تغلي بهم غليان المرجل and Allah revealed that if they were thrown into hell and they would be thrown into hell like wood is thrown into a flame if they were thrown into hell a ugly bad and very scary sound a frightening sound would be heard and while that hellfire would be like boiling it's so hot and and this what was mentioned is upon their entrance into hellfire while they would be entering into torture and they would be uh, very sad and depressed but also before that they were in a tight constricted situation and after that likewise their situation would not uh, be lightened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bihazi al-ayat yuzakiruna bi'azab jahannam حتى نبتعد عما يوقعنا في فيما فيما يوصلنا إليها. And Allah the Exalted in these verses reminds us of the torture of hellfire, and that uh, so that we would use it 
to stay far away from that which would make us deserving of falling into it. تكاد تميز من الغيظ تكاد تتميز يعني تتقطع وتتفرق من الغيظ على الكفار جعلت كالمغتاظة عليهم كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم الملائكة سألهم خزنتها أي الملائكة الذين هم وكلون بتعذيب الكفار في جهنم ألم يأتكم نذير ألم يأتكم من ينذركم من يخوفكم من ينبهكم من يقول لكم افعلوا ولا تفعلوا And the hellfire would be so fierce, it would be so strong that as if it's about to separate part of it from other parts of it, and that the hellfire was made as if it had a great anger and hatred towards those non-believers. And every time a group of them was put into hellfire, they would be asked by the angels who were given uh, responsibility over hellfire, they would, be, they would ask those non-believers, did not a warner come to you? Did not someone come to you, a prophet, who told you to do this and not to do this, who uh, tried to instill in you the fear of what was coming? وهذا السؤال يعني هذا تحقيرا لهم ليس أنه يعني أنهم يستفهمون منهم هم يعلمون أنه بلى جاءهم نذير لكن هذا معناه توبيخا لهم كيف تتركون كيف تتركون الـ الـ أوامر النذير الذي أنذركم كيف تتركون هذه الأمور ولا تطيعونه And this question when the angels asked them did not a warner come to you? This is a question to degrade them. It's not that the angels are asking them to know the answer, is it this way or not? No, the angels know that indeed a warner did come, but the angels are asking these questions to it further admonish those non-believers, as if to say to them, how could you abandon following the prophets? How could you avoid doing what was right قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء اعترفوا قالوا بلى جاءتنا النذر واخبرونا قالوا لنا افعلوا ما يخلصكم في الاخره افعلوا اوامر الله سبحانه وتعالى امنوا بالله لا تكفروا بالله واجتنبوا المعاصي قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير لكننا كذبناه وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء. Those non-believers after the angels asked them did not a warner come to you? They would admit. They say indeed. يعني indeed a warner did come. A warner came and they told us to do what God ordered you to do, to do what makes you protected from falling into hellfire. A warner did come ordering us to believe in God and to follow the prophets, but indeed we did belie them. قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير قال العلماء هذا إما أن الكفار هذا حكاية منهم ماذا قالوا لرسلهم ماذا قالوا للنذر أو أن الملائكة بعد أن يسمعوا من الكفار إجابتهم يقولون لهم إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير أي أنتم في خسران كبير Those non-believers, they, in their lifetime, they said that Allah didn't reveal anything. And then the next part uh, is either, you know, the scholar said that it is either uh, that the angels 
are telling them that surely you are at a great loss or it is mentioning what they used to say in their lives when they belied the prophets saying that truly you are lost or you are misguided when they belied the prophets saying that they're not correct فَمَعْنَى كَلَامِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ مَعْنَاهُ هَلَاكٍ وَكَلَا وَعَذَابٍ كَبِيرٍ And if it is taken as being the sayings of the angels to those non-believers, then its meaning is that truly you are in great destruction and punishment. وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ ما كنا في أصحاب السعير لو كنا نسمع سماع طالب الحق أو نعقله يعني استعملنا عقلنا الاستعمال الصحيح عقل المتأمل المتفكر المنتبه لما ينفعه في الآخرة ما كنا في أصحاب السعير ما كنا في أصحاب من أصحاب جهنم and then they would say, if only 